In April next year, Leif Bjornsson will retire as AstraZeneca's non-executive chairman, marking the end of more than a decade-long journey that's seen the global drug giant weather many a storm with as many milestones, including, of course, dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Earlier this year, the company completed the delivery of 3 billion doses of the COVID-19 vaccine just 18 months after its partnership for manufacturing with the University of Oxford. To discuss its experience and learnings from arguably the biggest challenge that the pharmaceutical industry and the global uh, humanity has faced in decades, the status of the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine launch pipeline and plans for India. Joining me today on the Global Dialogue is the man himself, Leif Hansen. Uh, many thanks uh, for joining us here on the show. It's always a pleasure. Good to have you here in India. Let me start by talking to you about uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, large parts of the world have had access to a COVID-19 vaccine, and that's thanks to AstraZeneca. Here in India specifically, with uh, the partnership that you have with Serum, more than 90% of the population that has been vaccinated has been vaccinated with Covishield. Uh, the experience of being able to put this vaccine in the market in a very short time, because there have been concerns on how much you can speed up science. But it's not just speed, it's also been scale. Uh, what have been the key learnings from the pandemic for you? I think there are many learnings there. The first one perhaps is that when it comes to innovation, we as a company, but also academia or for that matter governments, need to find new ways to cooperate. In our case, the fact that we got a question from Oxford University whether we could help industrialize and commercialize the vaccine was a new question to us and we said yes to that. But then we were able to roll out also and together with Serum Institute of India here in India at a very large scale, but also in, in 15 almost other places around the world. And of course, that meant that we could roll out commercially, industrially at speed. Uh, and then I think also uh, there is a lesson there that normally a uh, combination of academia, companies, corporations and, and government can learn from that by saying we can probably do 2x or 3x bigger, greater speed. Uh, you know, that's an important aspect that you brought up, the collaboration between academia, industry and government. And that clearly is visible uh, in the uh, COVID-19 vaccine that AstraZeneca put together. But, you know, you talked about how you were able to scale up because you were manufacturing across 15 different facilities. 15, and uh, 20, in fact, 25 different facilities, if I remember correctly. And of course, Serum here producing large quantities for India as well as the world. This brings to bear the debate and the discussion that, uh, that we've been having on whether IP uh, and uh, technology uh, restrictions hold back the ability to scale. And this has been something that the WTO uh, is seized with as well. In your experience, what is the way to bring in access? What is the way to bring in equity? How do we arrive at access and equity uh, while this vexed issue of IP continues to be debated and discussed? Well, I think it's important to realize that IP is the basis for our industry in the sense of creating innovative medicines or vaccines. And therefore, uh, it's a cornerstone of, of the cooperation between governments and, and companies. Uh, we spend about, the industry spends about 250 billion US dollars per year in re research and development. All of that actually comes from uh, the, the selling of the drugs that we are now in an innovative patented phase on. But having said that, it is also important that there is an opportunity to think differently at different unique times. We felt that this pandemic was unique enough to justify a not-for-profit decision, but also uh, a very strong uh, uh, spreading of technology and technology uh, transfer into many countries. Uh, and, though, and this is a u very unique experience, it's a unique situation, and then we can do unique things. Uh, but it's also important to recognize that industry needs to be able to generate uh, revenue to be able to fund um, f research for future medicines. 
Uh, yes, uh, you know, and, and that decision of AstraZeneca uh, to work on a not-for-profit model when it came to the COVID-19 pandemic, because as you said, uh, it was an op it was a time when the world required intervention, uh, you know, and it helped economies reopen. Uh, and I'm sure uh, that given what was happening around that time with uh, what other drug makers and vaccine makers were doing, there must have been questions on whether this was the right approach or not. Take me through, uh, you know, the, the, the debate and discussion within the organization as you arrived at the decision to take the not-for-profit route. Right. No, I, the, the obvious uh, trade-off there really is that... Uh, to, to take the long-term effects of needing to, re, to get revenue uh, at reasonable profits to be able to fund future medicines and vaccines versus short-term trying to solve a, the world's problem. And that obviously is a delicate balance. In, in this case, we at AstraZeneca decided that this was a unique enough situation to stay away from the principles and focus on really getting things done uh, in a short while. And, and obviously the fact that we did technology transfer, but also the fact that we did for no profit made it easy to work around the world. So we ended up delivering 3 billion doses of vaccine in more than 180 countries. And of course that's something that we think is good uh, and that we are proud of. Uh, you know, on the issue of vaccine supply, uh, it's one thing to have supply out in the market. It's a whole entire uh, matter to actually have that supply uh, reach people and get the vaccine into the arms of people. And what we have seen uh, through the course of the pandemic is that we started with not having enough supply and then we ended with having uh, enough supply to be able to vaccinate the world, but not enough takers. What do you take away from that experience. Mm. What do you take away from the fact that on the distribution side, there has been a significant setback? No, I think there, there is a very valuable uh, learning there. And that is that we as a pharmaceutical company, we can uh, research and develop uh, and industrialize a medicine or a vaccine. Uh, but we cannot actually get it directly to patients. For that, we require good uh, primary care systems and healthcare systems that can operate around the world in the most e efficient way. Uh, and I think we, are, we have different roles here. Uh, we as a company, we can provide very good, transparent, um, non-partial, good um, information about what we are doing, what the effects of our vaccine uh, in this case actually was, etc. But then regulators will need to be able to deal with that in, in, in a very good and efficient way such that citizens in their countries can feel in, uh, the, the trust of, of that whole system. And then finally, we actually need a lot of nurses uh, in many different parts of the world to be able to get those injections into the arms of patients.